I want to talk to you this morning quickly, uh, for the next couple of minutes, just about, uh, about loving God, just about getting back to your first love. And we're going to look at a portion of Scripture in the book of Revelation. And, and it's here in Revelation, the beginning of, of, of the book, that we find seven letters written to seven different churches in an area called Asia Minor, which we today know as, as Turkey and the surrounding countries. And so in, in these letters, you find three things. Every letter has three things. There's commendation, there's correction, and there's counsel. And so John writes the book of Revelation, but Jesus speaks through him. And Jesus, what he does is, he commands these churches. That's the first thing. He tells them, you're doing well over here. I'm proud of you. G keep going. But then he brings correction. He says, this is, this is what you need to change. But then there's also counsel. He says to them, this is how you need to change. Now, you may be wondering, what is the letter that was written way back then got to do with us today? See, here's the thing. It wasn't only written for them, but it was written for, to, to every church throughout every age. It applies as much to us today as it applied back then to them. How do we know that? <laughs> well, God wouldn't have put it in the Bible if it wasn't for us today. And toward the end of every letter, right at the end, he ends off every letter saying, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Plural. And so it's for every single one of us. And so we're going to focus on one specific letter, not all seven of them. But I want to look today at just one, and it's the one specifically written to the Ephesian church. Now, do you know we know more about the church in Ephesus than any other church in the Bible? It was a great church. It was a vibrant church. It was a, a, this church was led by a guy that we know pretty well, Timothy. Timothy was the leader of, of this church. And so the Bible just tells us so much about it. This church is born in Acts chapter 9. We see the, the birth of the church. And then throughout the book of Ephesians, we see how this church is encouraged. But then in the book of First and Second Timothy, we see the church being challenged and then rebuked. In the book of First, Second, and Third John, it's rebuked. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, we see how Jesus brings correction. And it's that, it's those couple of scriptures in the book of, of Revelation where he brings correction that we're going to look at today. And we're just going to spend some time on that. And we're going to see how does that, the correction brought to them way back then, how does that affect you and me today? So let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. And we read from verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. So Jesus is telling John, to the angel of the church write this. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now let me just pause here for a moment, quickly comment on this. All right, to the angel of the church, who's that? The senior pastor. All right? So he says, I want you to write to, to the senior pastor, to the angel. God usually speaks through the leader. These things says he who holds the seven stars. Who's, who's holding the seven stars? God. Who's the seven stars? What is the seven stars? It's the seven leaders as well, the seven pastors. So he holds them, but then he walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. What are the lampstands? It's the seven different churches. So he holds the leaders in his hand, God does, but he walks amongst his churches, all right? So the lampstands represent the churches. Now, if you think about it, a lampstand doesn't, uh, 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 isn't the light itself. It simply holds the light. 
the church itself isn't the light, we simply hold or reflect. We're supposed to reflect the light because Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, he is the light of the world, all right? The seven stars as well as we said, those are the seven leaders, the seven senior pastors because Daniel chapter 12 says, he who leads many to righteousness will shine like a star forever, all right? So that's just to clarify that first verse that we just understand because otherwise it can be a little bit confusing. What is all of that about? All right, let's move on to verse two. And this is where Jesus actually commends them. One of the things I love about Jesus is that he's not just trying to catch us doing what's wrong, but he actually wants to catch us doing what's right. And so he says to them, I know your works, your labor, your patience, And that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. And so what he's saying is, well done. I'm proud of you. Remember we said it was a good church. Now we move on to verse 4. And this is where he brings correction. He's commended them. You're doing well. Now he brings correction. And he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You've left your first love. Now listen, let me just say, if you've been saved for more than two or three years, there's a chance that you feel exactly the same. That you kind of saying, I don't know if I love him as much as I used to when I first got saved. I, I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm as excited as I, as I was back then. And, and if that's you today, relax, relax. Many people throughout the ages, many Christians have felt exactly the same. You, you're not alone in feeling like that. Uh, and even the church in Ephesus felt exactly like that, all right? And so just just Relax. Because here's the good news. You can change that. And it's actually pretty easy to change it. And he shows us how. In the very next verse, he actually gives us counsel. And he says, this is how you do it. Now listen to this. He says, consider how far you've fallen. So in other words, what he's saying, consider where you were when you first got saved. And where you are right now. Because if you're in denial and you're saying, oh, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Well, then there's nothing to fix and you can't fix anything. But if if you're honest and you say, I consider where I was. I recognize where I was. And maybe I'm not quite there. (laughs) That's honesty. He says, says, that's the first step, all right? Isn't that always the first step to mending something? All right. And then he says this. He says, consider that. And then here's the counsel. Repent and do the things you did at first. It's very simple, really. All he's saying is, do what you did when you first got saved, when you first gave your life to Christ. Now, think about it. What was that? What did you do back then? Well, let me share with you quickly maybe my experience, what I did. And, and, and I know we're all different but it'll give you a pretty good idea. It'll probably trigger where you at. So I remember when I first got saved, I was just, just a youngster, but there was just such an excitement for God and, and, and just gratitude, just so much gratitude that, that you know what, my, my past has been wiped away, my future's secure, and, and I can put my head on the pillow tonight and I can sleep and I can have peace like I've never had before. There was just so much gratitude. You identify with that? All right, and then I remember just worship, just as as a as a youngster coming to the youth group on a Friday night and worshiping God in a, in, a, in a way that I hadn't experienced before, just connecting with God. And so we weren't singing songs anymore. I, I just I remember just just connecting, just just worshiping God. And so it was just on another level for me. And then and then I remember. God's Word, and just wanting to learn more, and sitting here every Sunday in church, and and that was way back in the old building, and just listening to my dad, and taking notes, 
because I'd never taken notes before. But suddenly I wanted to take notes. Suddenly I knew, you know, I, I, need, to, I need to write some of this stuff down. And, and I, would, I would even make some, scribble some notes in my Bible. I've still got that Bible till today. And, and, and if I had to flip it open and show you, I mean, some of those, some of those pages have got more notes on than, than print. You know, it's just, I've written all over those, those pages. And you know what I've noticed over the years? When people start growing cold, they start typically losing some of those things I've just explained to you. Just their excitement for God, their gratitude. It's almost like, ah, you know what? Oh, I'm saved, you know. Worship. Ah, they're not really bothered about worship. You know, it's almost like, ah, let's get these songs over and done. I just want to quickly hear what Leonard has to say. And when, when, when Leonard speaks, it's almost like, yeah, I've heard that before. You know, and they're not, they're not even bothered about taking notes and stuff like that. You know what I've admired about Pastor Sid, who's in his 70s, is that he takes notes every single Sunday. After like 50 years of, of serving God in ministry, because he went into ministry straight after school. Uh, after like 50 years of that, he's still taking notes, still eager to learn. And so if you're here today, you know, look, I don't want to put anything on anybody if you're not taking notes. No, don't worry, please, don't worry. But I want to encourage you. Write down what God is saying. Forget about what Leonard's saying. But God speaks to us. And just, just jot that down. Just, just make a note. Even if you write one sentence of service, but you'll find for some people, they write a page or two. And just, just write down the things that you sense God is saying to you. And you're saying, God, this is important. Thank you for speaking to me today. And during the week, you can just go through that and just, just go and read it again and, and just refresh your memory because, because we take this seriously. And then when you get into the Bible, maybe here's just, just, just one tip quickly. Look for treasure. Just look for treasure on the pages of your Bible. And look for them on the pages that you've read already. You've already read that. <laughs> but you know what I found? Very often when I go through the Bible, I read something. I discover something that I'd never really seen before. But I've read that page. I've read that chapter I don't know how many times, but maybe I wasn't ready for it. Maybe I didn't need it back then. I don't know. <laughs> All I'm saying is there are treasures on the pages of your Bible that if you start looking with those eyes, you're going to see them and, and they're going to they're pop out to you. Now, I know some people, when they look at the Bible, they think, oh, man, this is like, I'll never get through a, you know, this, this Bible. Listen, <laughs> let me just put it in a little bit of perspective, maybe just to help you. Do you know there are 1,800, 1,189 chapters in the Bible? 1,189. Now, let's round that off just to make it easy. Let's call it 1,200 chapters. If, if you had to read, let's say, 40 chapters a day. You say, Leonard, you're mad. I've got to be retired to do that. Okay, for the retired people, give me your attention. I normally speak to the young people, retired people. If you had to read 40 chapters a day, you'd cover it in a month. One month, you could read through the entire Bible. You say, there's no ways I can do 40. Okay, let's try 10 then. If you had to do 10 chapters a day, just, just, just 10, and you just stick to that, you work through the entire Bible, 120 days in, in four months. So Leonard, even 10 chapters a lot. Well, let's go then to five chapters, eight months. You've gone through the entire Bible. So that's just to put it in perspective. You can if you want to. Have you ever opened your Bible and read something and you think, I've read this before. And then you're tempted to, to flip the page or to skip that day, say a quick prayer and then get on with your, I've read this before. Have you ever sat down to a meal, a good meal, that you've had before? What do you do? Do you push the plate to say, I've had this before, I can skip today. No, we don't do that. Otherwise, we wouldn't look like this, would we? All right. So we have it. We even have some seconds sometimes. But Leonard, you've had it before. I know, but this is good. And my body needs nourishment, you know. 
I, I'm nourished for the next year, I'm telling you. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Our souls need nourishment. Our souls need nutrition. When you and I get into the Word, even though we've read it before, we, we, we are getting that nutrition, we're getting that, that nourishment. Now, I've shared with you when I first got saved, you know, just the, just the excitement for God. You know, we were excited for, for, for the Lord. We, we were excited about church. And then what happens very often, you want to just invite somebody because you're excited and it's done so much for you. To just, just come along. What is that called? Witnessing. Witnessing. It's helping others. To, you you, you want to share with them about Jesus. But you know what I found? The longer we are saved, the less we witness. The less we talk about Jesus. The less excited we are. And, and it's normal. Let me just say to you, it's, 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 it's a normal tendency in life because if you buy a new car, what happens, the longer you have it, the less excited you are about it. If you have a new wife, the longer you marry, the, okay, I'm not like this one. Bad example in it, just bad example. I still love you, baby. All right. But you get what I'm saying. Amen? And so it's normal for us. And so, so we're less excited about, about God and and about the church, and so what happens? We, we don't really witness, we don't really tell anybody about it, and I'm not suggesting that you, from now on, you're going to go out of here, and you're going to speak to at least seven people a day. When you get to the spa just now, or to Willie's, and you're standing in the queue with your trolley, you know, you reach over, and you tap the person on the shoulder in front of you, excuse me, excuse me, do you know Jesus they look at you with a frown and you say, oh, clearly not. That means that, that, that you lost, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. But don't fear, because I can tell you about Jesus. And Jesus loves you, and, and you carry on. And then you say, to him, would, you, would you keep my place in the queue here? Because I need to go and talk to somebody else about Jesus. Don't do that. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> we don't do weird. Come on. Because nobody is interested. And where they, they run away. I, I'm talking about just weaving God into your conversation in the most natural way you possibly can. Just, you know, God just been good to me. Well, you know, I, I'm just, I'm so enjoying church of late. Or just, just, just a comment, just a sentence. Just weave God into, into your conversation. I, I remember uh, before Liesl and I got married, I had a group of, of friends, single guys, and um, we would cycle together. We, we, we'd spend lots of hours together riding. And um, I remember at one stage, the one guy just wasn't around anymore. And so uh, somebody asked, he said, hey, listen, what happened to so-and-so? Is he, is he sick? You know, and, um, and somebody, one of the other guys said, he's very sick. He, he is so sick, you know, he met a girl. <laughs> he's sick. <laughs> And so, you know, just, just, just a week or two later, Liesl and I bumped into him in Eastgate in the mall, and, um, and there he was standing alone in a, in a, in a shop, just, just bored out of his mind, just, just, you know, he seemed so uncomfortable, he's just kind of standing around, leaning on, 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 on clothing racks and stuff, and so I walk up to him, I'm like, hey, how you doing? We've been missing you. And so, man, before he could even say anything, he's talking about this girl. She's busy shopping up a storm. The poor oak is just standing there waiting. But he doesn't mind at all, you know. I'm looking at him. I can see he's bored out of his mind. But, man, he's so excited about her. He's telling us about this girl and everything, you know, this, and, and, and on and on he goes. What was busy happening? Two things. He wanted to spend time with her, even though he was bored out of his mind, and it was going to change very soon after they got married. Never happened again. All right. But he, <laughs> he wanted to spend time with her, and he wanted to talk about her. Why? Because he was just so in love. And so that's what happens when you and I are in love with Jesus. We want to spend time. And somehow there's something in us that... that we just, we just want to share with other people. We just want to tell them how good God has been to us. 
And, and so let me say to you, it's not just the unsaved that need that. You, you don't have to you know, just look for unsaved people to share with them. Sometimes I found the saved needed more. Have you ever been around somebody who's just excited about Jesus and just, just enjoying Jesus and, and somehow there's something that rubs off? You know, when I spend a little bit of time with Uncle Angus, just, just a couple of th- moments or, or, you know, on the phone or something like that, there's something that rubs off, isn't that? And so I think, I think that's what Jesus wants us to do and to be to the people around about us. All right, now, when Jesus says through John, he says, you've left your first love. I have this against you. You've left, you left your first love. Notice he doesn't say you've lost it. He says you've left it. Because if you lose something, you can't go and get it again. You don't, you don't know where it is. You don't know where you've, where you've lost it. But if you've left it, you can go back and get it again. And so basically what Jesus is saying to you and to me today, not only to the church of Ephesus, he's saying, I want you to go back and to go and get your first love again. You know what he's saying? Just go back to basics. It's as simple as that. It's as easy as that. He's not saying, well, now you've got to do this. And now you've got to take this massive next step. And now you've got to go and do Bible college. Nothing. He says, just, just get back to basics and you'll find you're going to enjoy him like you did right in the beginning. And so you'll find our first love, when the Bible talks about our first love, it refers to our initial love when we just got saved. But it also refers to the most important love. So it's not only our initial love, but the most important love that Jesus Christ is, is, is everything. He's priority in our lives. And if he is priority, <laughs> it means then the things of God become priority. Reading his word is, is important to me. It's priority. That's how God speaks to me. That's how he leads and guides me. Coming to church is important. It's priority. And so for many of you, I know it's priority because you hear week after week after week. How do I know that? Because you sit in exactly the same chair, man. <laughs> and it doesn't help you because the Sunday where you're not here, I'm thinking, I wonder where they are. <laughs> All right. But it, I can see it's priority. It's priority. And so when it comes to, to giving, our giving needs to be priority. If Jesus is priority, then, then our giving tithing is priority. Because our attitude is, God, I wouldn't have this job if it wasn't for you. But you are my provider. And so all I want to do is just return to your house what you've, what you've given me. And so if he's priority, everything else comes after that. I spend time with with God in the Word, and the day follows after. I spend time on a Sunday like this, you and I do, and whatever else we want to do comes after that. Our spending, I I give to God, and, and everything else comes after that. If I don't have money left, that's fine, but that is not even, I'm not even giving it to God. I don't pay my tithes. I just return it because that actually, that 10% doesn't belong to me. I just give it back to him. All right, let's move on. One day they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. Why did they ask him that? Because they had something like 700, there was actually more than 700 different commandments. And so they were actually trying to trick him. And so they wanted, which is the greatest? I mean, how on earth do you pick which is the, the, the best, the greatest, the most important? But without hesitating, Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. Notice he says, with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. You see, God is an is a all or nothing God. We love Him 
with everything or nothing at all. And that's what he wants. That's why Jesus says, I want you to come back to your first love, your all or nothing. Because that's how I want you to, to love me. But do you know when Jesus said that, when Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, he was actually quoting Old Testament. Because 1,500 years before, God's prophet Moses was busy addressing God's people, the Israelites. This was just before they went into the promised land. And he says to them, if you want God's blessing upon you, love him with all your heart. If you want his hand upon you, love him with all your soul and all your strength. Listen to this Deuteronomy. Here's the Old Testament. Moses says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. <laughs> so he says, you want God's hand, you want God's blessing, you, you, this is what you do. One commandment with a lifelong blessing. One commandment with a lifelong blessing. So, both Moses and Jesus encourages us, get back to your first love. It's almost like God saying, I know you're going to drift a little bit with time. I know you're going to get a little bit cold with time. Get back to your first love. If you want God's blessing upon your life, get back to your first love. Now, they're telling us to love God. Let me just tell you for a moment or two, and then I'm done. This is my last thought. Let me tell you about God's love for us. <laughs> because somehow when you understand just a little bit, I will never understand His love. But if you can grasp just a little bit of His love, it's easy to love Him. And so one of the things that we need to understand about God's love is that it cannot be earned. It cannot be earned. There's nothing that you and I can do or not do that will cause God to love us any more or any less. You know, the Apostle Paul said, nothing can separate us from God's love. The worst thing that you've done, what he's saying is, cannot separate you from God's love. And then the psalmist comes and he says, you know, when I go to heavens, God, you are there. When I go to the depths of the sea, you are there. You're everywhere. And in 1 John chapter 4, it says that God is love. God is love. And so his love is everywhere. We can't get away from his love. You may be thinking, but Leonard, man, I, you know, I've... I'm, I'm battling with, with, with a bad habit. I'm battling to, I've got this addiction, you know. I, I haven't been that good. Listen, God doesn't love you because of what you've done or haven't done. He loves you in spite of what you've done. And I know that's difficult for you and me to understand. And that's not a license to go and do the wrong stuff. But that's the God who we serve. In spite of what we've done, He loves us. Do you know the Bible says in, in, in Matthew chapter 10 that God actually knows the very number of hairs on each of our heads? Now, in my case, it's really not difficult, all right? <laughs> but now, listen, listen, listen. I know that points toward God's all-knowing, omniscience, all right? He knows everything. But we get stuck there. We said, okay, the, you know, he knows everything. Actually, that, that scripture has got nothing to do with counting. It's got to do with interest. God takes an intense interest in you and me, every single one of us. So when you lose a couple of hairs in the shower, God knows that. When you lose a bit of sleep over something you're concerned about, God knows that. When, when you lose a little bit of money in a business transaction, He knows that. When you lose a good customer or, or a contract or something, God knows that. God knows everything, every detail of our lives. And so when you and I come to Him in prayer, you're coming to a God who, who loves you 
and who knows everything about you. And it's almost as if nothing else, no one else exists. And he gives you full attention. That's how much God loves you and me. And some people don't understand it. They, you know, they're like, I, I hope God likes me. I, I hope I've been good enough. <laughs> Listen, friends, let me just say to you, there will always be things in your life and in my life where we feel maybe we don't quite measure up. I could have maybe handled that conversation a little bit better. My thought life could have been purer. You know, I got angry with that, but you know what I'm saying? There will always be that side, and the enemy will try and ride that thing, try and tell us that we're just not good enough, and we've got to understand it doesn't affect his love. It really doesn't affect his love. Because God loves us in spite of what we've done. We can never be good enough for his love. Because the Bible says that he loved us while we were still sinners. Romans 5 verse 8, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Wow. And then in, in, in Jeremiah uh, uh, 31, I think it's verse 3, it's not on the screen. He says, He loves us with an everlasting love. So while we were still sinners, he loved us. And that love just keeps on right into eternity with an everlasting love. God will love us and love us and love us. And so please get this. Our love for God, because that's what we're talking about today, is really just in response to what God has already done for us. Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, we love because he first loved us. And so when you get that, it's actually really easy to love him back. Because suddenly you, you just pause for a moment and you realize God is so good. God has loved us so much. I just, I want to love him back. I just somehow want to reciprocate. And so let's bring this closer to home. Can I ask you this morning, what is God saying to you? Over and above my voice, what do you sense God is saying to you? And if you're taking notes, just jot that down. Because for various of us, it, it's various things. But you need to respond to God and just say, Lord, I hear you loud and clear. I haven't been spending time in your word or I just, I haven't been grateful or I haven't been tithing. Whatever it is, God, I want to get back to basics. Thank you so much for what you've done in my life. I think most of us, we start off well. Come on. <laughs> we start well and we're excited about God and excited about church. And then along the way, we, we grow a little bit cold. We become maybe a little bit casual. Life gets very busy. Man, there are many excuses. But the bottom line is we get a little bit cold. My prayer today is that our love for him will be fanned back into flame. Have you, have you ever seen coals on a fire and there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a glow but you put a fan or something on that or you, you blow it and within moments within moments it just starts glowing again and that's my prayer that you and I will have such a desire for the things of God that there'll be such a passion in our lives just to love Jesus to serve Jesus to be obedient to Jesus, that our passion for Him will be the greatest passion of our lives. Nothing else. Not business, not my toys, not my kids, not this church. <laughs> my passion for Jesus 
is the greatest passion of our lives because that's what he wants for us to love him with all of our hearts come on let's stand Let's buy it. Lord, we come before you this morning. And we recognize, each one of us, how far we've fallen. Where we were and where we are today. <laughs> and we want to correct that. And thank you, Lord, for bringing just a loving correction this morning. But also telling us how, giving us the counsel. And so we want to respond. And so you've spoken to each one of us and you've dropped something different and something unique within our hearts. We respond to that now and we say, Lord, we are intentionally drawing closer to you because we love you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for what you've done, your forgiveness your grace, your incredible patience with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we respond to that love today just in wanting to love you back. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. Bless you.